Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mobbin coming at you with another AP Gov YouTube video. Uh, we are taking a look today at topic 1.5, focusing in on the ratification of the U.S. Constitution. So we're talking about moving from America's first independent government, that was Articles Confederation, which uh, did end up in failure in a pretty short amount of time, to the framework for governing that we still operate today, the Constitution. Now note, uh, the uh, the rules, the details that are going to be going into this framework for government are going to be the result of tremendous debate uh, and discussion amongst those framers in uh, Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. Now, when we talk about uh, the important decisions that are made, uh, amongst the folks that were in attendance, uh, Clearly, the most important issue was, how are we going to craft a new legislative body? We know under the Articles of Confederation that it was a unicameral system, one chamber. Every state got one vote, and 9 thirteenths needed to pass a law, 13 out of 13, to make an amendment. So we know under the Articles, it was certainly based on the notion of state equality and making it very difficult for laws to be passed by the national government, uh, all in an attempt to really limit the power of the national government and emphasize statehood and state equality. Uh, but that's going to come under fire from many of the folks from the big states, high populous states, such as those delegates coming from Virginia. Uh, this Virginia plan, as it would be commonly known, is going to be advocating for a strong central government, a big, powerful national government one that is going to have significant amount of authority in terms of things like taxation, national defense, regulation of business, amongst other things. Uh, they wanted a bicameral legislature, uh, meaning two-chambered, but each of those chambers will be based on population. So the idea being is that uh, representation in the Congress will be based on having more delegates, more representatives coming from states with higher populations and less representatives coming from states with, you know, less or less population. Uh, so the idea being is that, you know, representation should be in proportion to where the people are living. Uh, but the core to this is, yes, having a strong central government up to and including creating, which did not exist under the Articles of Confederation, an actual national, national executive branch uh, and a national judiciary. Uh, so we're talking about a much bigger, much more powerful national government with a uh, Congress whose representation is based on population. Now, that might be fine for the big states, the high population states, but uh, smaller population states such as New Jersey are going to be very concerned about this. Uh, they're going to be advocating for a weaker central government, uh, you know, with a unicameral legislature, with every state getting one vote. So hopefully you're kind of picking up on the message that you know, a lot of the small states are going to be advocating for not a whole lot of change from what you saw under the Articles of Confederation. You know, perhaps an easier threshold to pass laws and, and have amendments made and things like that. But the emphasis being on the New Jersey plan is that states should all be viewed equally, that they all came in as equal states and they should maintain that uh, within this new framework for government. Um, but these two forces are going to be at loggerheads. I mean, this is really going to be a nasty, nasty debate. Uh, but thankfully, cooler heads will prevail, especially led by the delegation from Connecticut. Uh, this group will propose what's going to be known as the Great Compromise. And the idea is basically in terms of creating the Congress, taking parts of the Virginia plan and the New Jersey plan and putting it together. So what is going to eventually be approved in terms of a legislature uh, is going to be what we call Congress. This new Congress under the Constitution will be a bicameral legislature, so two-chambered. But they're not both going to be based on population like Virginia would have liked, and they weren't both based on state equality, which New Jersey would have liked, but rather one for each. Uh, one of the chambers will be dubbed the House of Representatives that chamber will have its representation based on population. The other chamber will be the Senate, where, you know, kind of taking from the, the small state model, that every state would be represented equally in that, in that chamber, regardless of population size. 
Uh, so it's going to be meeting the best of both worlds in terms of the needs of those two types of states. And note, no law could be passed without a simple majority of approval from both the House and the Senate. You had to have both, not one or the other. Something else that is going to be uh, showing uh, you know, diverse interests in terms of you know, the ideals in terms of to what degree should the people, the masses, be able to have influence over leadership uh, in our new government under the Constitution. Uh, in the House, we're going to see that members are going to be directly elected by the people. Uh, so this is going to be uh, perhaps the clearest example of the impact of the people having a voice in the federal government directly elected by the population. Now, of course, that voting population in reality is going to be a very small percentage of the total population, excluding, yeah, you know, it's going to be excluding women, people of color, uh, you know, states are going to typically going to have property requirements early on. Uh, so there's going to be, you know, a very, very small pool that would be considered the voting population. But still, that group is going to be choosing the House, and that's going to lead to the reputation of the House always being considered the voice of the people, the chamber of the people, the people's uh, chamber. Uh, whereas in the Senate, you're going to see more of this idea that if you're going to have a chamber represented in part by the masses, you know, the people's chamber, the House, uh, there is this notion amongst the founding fathers that the, the masses, the people can easily be swayed, they can be easily swept up in emotion, they can you know, push for rapid change in government very, very quickly. And these were folks that did not really want a government that was super fast in how they got things done, especially in, in the legislative branch. These were folks that are also concerned that the House is probably going to be representing more of the interests of the common man, the poor, the working man, and that could potentially be to the detriment of the wealthy elites, which many of the founders, of course, were a part of. So that leads to how the Senate is going to be choosing its members. Members of the Senate, at least when this Constitution is originally created, is not going to be chosen, have its members chosen by the people, but rather chosen by state legislatures. So if you are running to become a U.S. Senator from Georgia, you wouldn't get the voters of Georgia's approval to get that, that job you would need the support of the majority of the Georgia state legislature to get that job. And so what this does is limit direct citizen voting. Now note, uh, you know, it, it, it is still representative, but it's just in a more indirect way because how do people, you know, get on the Georgia legislature, if you will, the folks that would be George, uh, choosing the U.S. Senator from Georgia? Well, those people would be elected by the people. So it, it's not totally disconnecting itself from the voting population, but it does add another layer to it. Uh, so be mindful of how the, uh, the new Congress will be crafted by this uh, Constitutional Convention. But that's going to be just the first of many important decisions that are going to have to be made at this meeting. Another one of these key decisions will be how do we determine, you know, if we're going to have, for example, a House of Representatives chosen by the people, chosen by the voters, well, who will be these eligible voters? You know, how, is, how are we going to determine voter uh, eligibility? Is it going to be everybody? Well, that certainly was not on the forefront of the Founding Fathers, unfortunately. Uh, they automatically just assumed going in. There wasn't really any debate at all about women and people of color. That was, you know, out of hand, not even considered. But what was considered to some degree is amongst white men, you know, who would be considered eligible voters? Would it be open to all white men? Would it be open to those that owned so much property or had so much, uh, you know, wealth in the bank, so to speak? Would it be based on uh, being a member of a certain religious sect? Uh, so there were some questions there. But basically what the founders do in the Constitution, they kind of just punt in this situation. They don't take a firm stance on it. They kick it down to the states and they basically say that, the states themselves will be choosing uh, the eligibility rules for their own voters. Now, of course, over the years, uh, there will be federal laws that will be passed, and there will be constitutional amendments that will be passed that are going to, you know, kind of uh, dictate to the states to some degree, you know, who they can't exclude. Uh, but still to this day, states determine who their eligible voters are. For example, there are some states that, if you have ever been convicted of a felony, you can't ever vote in that state ever again. Whereas in other states, you 
could have been convicted of a felony, you're still fine to vote. So states do have that prerogative. Uh, when it comes to this new thing called the executive branch of the, of, the, of the federal government, how would this be organized? How would it be led? You know, we know it's going to be having the job of enforcing uh, laws passed by Congress, but how is that going to be made up? Well, they decide to have a singular person, a singular president, as they will call it, be the person in charge of enforcement of federal law. Uh, but it's not going to be like the House of Representatives where the people will direct, directly elect. It will be done in an indirect way. Now, it's, it's not going to be chosen by the state legislatures directly, but close to that. Uh, we will see the founders create a unique uh, entity known as the Electoral College, whose sole job is to choose the President of the United States. Now, who gets to be in the Electoral College? Well, that's going to be chosen by the state legislature. So, if you're talking about you know folks from Delaware in the Electoral College, well, the Delaware state legislature chooses those Delawareans uh, who would be in the Electoral College. Uh, now, granted, the people of Delaware would elect the state legislators who then elect the Electoral College members who then elect the president. Uh, and you can kind of see there, it's not a complete disconnect from the people, but you can see there's many layers buffering between the job of being elected president and the people themselves, no question about it. Uh, similar, and, you know, it's in fact, it's even more layered than what we see uh, the process being for choosing U.S. Senators. Also, just a quick reminder, the, the U.S. Uh, Senator positions will eventually become directly elected by the people following the 17th Amendment in 1913. Uh, the other important decision that's going to be made uh, at the Constitution will be issues regarding uh, how slaves would be counted in terms of representation purposes. Now, let's make sure we get this straight. There is no debate in terms of whether or not uh, enslaved peoples would be allowed to vote. That was right off the bat, that's, that's not going to be allowed. But the question does become, how are these folks to be considered for representation purposes? Uh, Southerners wanted slaves to be counted for representation purposes because, logically, that would mean, you know, since the vast majority of slaves were in the South at the time, that meant that that would give the Southern states more representation in the House. Conversely, Northern states, which had very few slaves left by this point in time, uh, did not want slaves to be counted as a person for representation purposes because they wanted to maintain their power in the House of Representatives. Uh, so that being said, like we've done with some of these other tough decisions, uh, it's going to be a compromise that, that's hashed out. And the compromise is going to be the infamous three-fifths compromise. It is a you know, horrifically dehumanizing way to settle this this issue, uh, but slavery is a dehumanizing institution. So, you know, what do you expect, unfortunately? Uh, but the decision will be uh, made that slaves would be considered three-fifths of a person for representation purposes in Congress, meaning the House of Representatives, and for the Electoral College. Uh, so that's going to be significant. So once again, just be aware that, you know, there's going to be a number of important decisions that are going to be made in this Constitutional Convention that will involve uh, either some degree of compromise uh, or some degree of kind of passing the buck to the states to make these ultimate decisions. You will see, uh, to some degree, a willingness to let the people have uh, direct say on who their leaders will be. But in many other cases, most of the cases, it's going to be in a much more indirect way. So we're going to go ahead and leave it there for now. Next time, we're going to be taking a look at the actual formal structure of the Constitution uh, on an article-by-article -article basis. We'll see you next time.